So, welcome to the Lost Tales, and my last two sort of episodes of Babylon 5 in terms of its, its, its original period of run, really, even though these came out in 2007, which was several years after the end of the, the core original series, and indeed Crusade. Um, so, what can I tell you about these? Um, it's an it's a, a subtle irony that these two episodes, although they're just known as the Lost Tales, they are they do have separate titles apparently, and the titles are over here and over there. But the the irony I'm referring to is that JMS was intending the Lost Tales to be more than just two episodes. The Lost Tales could have been a sixth season of Babylon 5 in effect as a sort of anthology style of show um, but ironically the Lost Tales got lost because they never happened um, so you know there is a, a large dose of irony to be had in the uh, the title of these two um, attempts now I've had the Lost Tales knocking about on my shelves for several years now because obviously they came out 16 years ago in 2007 um, you know it's been a long time and at the time when I watched them, I'd, I was a bit sort of meh about them because they are more of the same and they're not, they weren't sort of radically different. But as I've watched through them again on a, you know, a fairly sort of modern monitor and everything else, having just watched the rest of the entirety of the series... I find that, as with Crusade, I'm rather saddened that that era of Babylon 5 is, is only represented by an hour and ten minutes of screen time. Because, for starters, it's in widescreen. Um, it's obvious that most of it is done using CGI. This budget is clearly direct to DVD. Um, the corridors and a lot of the sort of backup sets look quite spartan that people are actually walking through. Lockley's quarters, for example, in the first episode don't have a lot of accoutrement to them. Um, and yet, and yet they're, they're also strangely big for Babylon 5 quarters and strangely placed as well. She's actually got a window, but I'll come to that. Um, but what I did like about it was that they were kind of like spotlight episodes. So each of the episodes, you know, one's very much focused on Lockley, one's very much focused on Sheridan, with with guest actors as well, but not with sadly with the full cast, of course, because we'd lost several members of the full cast even by then. And that was one of the reasons why JMS didn't want to go sort of full bore into more Babylon 5 stuff, because I think, you know, from the point of view of his own soul, he didn't feel he could at that point in time. We'd lost um, Richard Biggs and um, Andreas Katsoulas at that point. Frankton and Jakar had passed away. Um, so, you know, it's it's very, very difficult for him, I think, at this point in time to do much more than this. But the other thing about these episodes is that they benefit from far more modern CGI. And you look at the way that the station's been done, even when you compare it to The Road Home, which has just come out at the time of recording, The Road Home is a reinvention and it's a different style of animation. So it's not comparing like for like. But for me, the, the renditions of things like the Star Furies, even to the background ships and the station, is so much more sophisticated than it was in the original series in The Lost Tales. And it would have been gorgeous to see more of that sort of level of production in a new series or an ongoing series, some sort of continuation at the time, because we just didn't get it, unfortunately. We just didn't get it. So let me give you some context now. So it's 2271. So we are... Nine years since now Colonel Lockley took over Babylon 5 and 10 years since the start of the Interstellar Alliance. And there is a celebration going on for that anniversary, which is what the, the episode is kind of loosely centred around. But actually, 
the plots are relatively unrelated, except for the fact that Lockley mentions that Sheridan is due at Babylon 5 in the first episode, and then he arrives at Babylon 5 in the second episode. So, you know, that, that sort of tracks. So it's it's two episodes shot more or less as one across a period of about 72 hours. So it's... It's, it's not long enough to be a movie as such, but it's kind of like a TV movie sort of length, I suppose. You know, if you put enough adverts in there, you could probably get it up to an hour and a half or so. Um, so the episode starts where you immediately see a new hyperspace um, animation, if you like. So you immediately sort of think, oh, that's a bit different. Um, but obviously the technology may have moved on since, um, since the, the start of the Interstellar Alliance. And... Lockley has made an unusual requisition from Earth, which is a priest, one Father Cassidy. And um, I was trying to to figure out where I knew his character from. A gentleman called Alan Scarf played him. And when I looked it up, I smiled to myself because it's from a show called Seven Days, which is a suitably obscure science fiction show that I remember because it involves science fiction and time travel and it was on terrestrial British TV, therefore I watched it. Um, and that's why I, I couldn't quite place him. He, he, he's also played a couple of Romulans and, and stuff as well on, on Star Trek, but obviously, you know, more heavily made up. But I knew I knew his face and his voice from somewhere. So, basically, Lockley has detained a chap who has been behaving very erratically. And there is a, a measurable temperature change as you approach the, the room where he's being held. And... The, the episode basically sort of revolves around a debate of God versus science in the sense that the church is, has been in decline for a number of years because, of course, humanity has gone to the stars and hasn't found any winged beings apart from perhaps, you know, well, spoilers. Anyway, moving on. Um, so there is this sort of debate about whether or not the church you know still has a purpose in life basically you know is that are there still enough faithful to to support its continued existence so it's taking him a little while to get out to babylon 5 because there aren't many priests in space funnily enough um but lockley explains that she is sort of somewhat religious but only when she feels guilty about not being religious enough and um, he acknowledges that that's and that's not uncommon so she reports that there have been sort of voices, there have been smells that they just can't explain since this guy arrived, this guy called Simon Burke. And he'd, he'd been to Earth and he's, and he's come back. And they go into his room together, um, Cassidy and Lockley initially. And she explains that they found him once covered with blood, but the blood wasn't his and there was no human DNA in it. And when they sort of mention, or when he mentions the smell being offensive, he then suggests that he's changed it to roses. Or Lockley says it smell, now smells like roses. But Cassidy says to her after they've left that that could have just been suggestion. So he is far from convinced that this guy is possessed because this is what Lockley has brought him on board for. She wants an exorcism because she thinks this guy is possessed by some sort of evil spirit. Um, and there's a very interesting sort of back and forth between Berg and Cassidy, because Cassidy's been very, very measured in how he deals with him, because he needs to assess for himself or not it's some form of psychosis, or whether there's something else going on. And he is amazed that you know, he makes various statements and various things happen, but he does say to Lockley that there are other potential explanations for all of those things. And then a great big sort of shroud of fire envelops the station, um, which kind of puts it puts beyond doubt the fact that he's definitely got some firepower in him. Um, and oddly for a demon, he wants to be exercised. He actually wants Cassidy to cast him out. And... He's suggesting to Cassidy, and there's this sort of temptation element to it, that um, if the if people found out that a devil or you know an evil spirit of some sort did exist, the church would actually get a boost off the back of that because it would be proved positive that there was still a need for the church. 
So basically, he's sort of telling him, you know, you've, you've got to do it one way or the other. Because if people, if you, if you leave it, people are going to find out I'm here and why and why you're here. And then the word is going to spread. And then, you know, the church will do all right. So, you know, you can't sort of, you can't leave me and you can't do anything about it. Because if you don't cast me out, then you'll be condemning an innocent soul to suffering. So, you know, the only thing you can do is cast me out. So it's very, very interesting. And it's, it puts both Lockley and Cassidy in a bit of a quandary. And, you know, Cassidy basically says, you know, that he'd need a phalanx of priests. It's a nice collective now for, for priests um, in order to fully assess him and determine whether or not an exorcism was the best thing to do. But that will, of course, will take time and will attract attention. Um, so very, very difficult. Whilst all this is going on, there are some nice establishing shots of the station with this enhanced CGI that I've mentioned, but we all, and we're also getting quite a lot of ship types as well that we've seen before. So we're getting enhanced Vri, we're getting non, um, Jaquan class cruisers, we're getting Minbari cruisers, there's white stars, there's even the work be at one point, there's star furies, of course, zipping about. There's even, I think, a warlock class cruiser parked near to Babylon 5, um, which is only the second time we've ever seen them canonically in the series outside of Crusade. So, you know, it's, it, again, they're sort of reusing all of the stuff that's come before, so the consistency is very much there, which is great. Um, so, we then see Lockley in her quarters at night, and she's trying to sleep, but she can't, so she gets up and starts pacing, and she starts asking the computer questions about um, Simon Burke's background and his recent trip to Earth and back from Earth. And then something occurs to her, and I was somewhat distracted at this point because she's got this huge window in her quarters, which none of the quarters ever used to have in the original series. So an, an external window onto space, which I think is, is interesting for the commanding officer, but it both is sensible, but also risky. If, you know, I'm sure you can understand why. Um, but when there's a later shot when it sort of the camera pulls out from that window into space and you can see where she's on station and that's why every now and again a bit of the station actually obscures her window because of the rotation so it's cleverly done and i can see why why they would have put it where they put it it's clever um but she calls up the the logs of the um, the liner asimov good old liner asimov it's been mentioned before in the series it's a very very regular to her and throw her from Earth to the station. And she realises that the there were anomalies on the Asimov as it was coming from Earth with Burke. And that allows her to put two and two together. And I, I quite like the sort of the resolution of it. Um, and basically she realises that what's happened in fact is that this demon wasn't, as he suggested, sort of chained to this person. So he wants to be sort of set free so he can, he can go out and back into heaven. He was actually chained to Earth. So the only way he could, he could get away from Earth was to take over Burke and be taken away from Earth so that when he was exorcised, he would then be free of his earthly bounds. So Burke gets heavily sedated because um, it's understood that if the, the host is sedated, then the, the demon will be as well. And Lockley basically socks it to him, basically says, I don't think you've, you've come out here to, you know, to benefit the church. You've come out here to benefit yourself. You've come out here knowing that the priest would be obliged to exorcise you. Um, it would be the right thing to do and it could benefit the church you sold him on that story but actually there's another option which is to take you back to earth and exorcise you there because one day the earth will be gone and you will still be chained there but we will be free of you because we'll have left the earth behind and spread throughout the universe and we'll have a new dream that will be without you basically um and so with that, the the, um, the the host's eyes sort of glow and then he collapses. But before he does that, he says, we will remember you. And uh, to which uh, Lockley replies, yep, 
and I'll remember you too. And I'm going to tell all my friends about you so that if anything like this ever happens again, we'll know how to deal with you. So it's nicely done. And it's very much a sort of commanding performance from Lockley in terms of how she handles it all. And um, we then pull away from her quarters, as I mentioned, and we immediately transition over to Minbar. And that is where the second episode begins. So we see various things happening. We see Sheridan's got a sort of a, a new sort of funky way of communicating where he sort of puts his fingers together a couple of times and that kind of opens a link. Um, and he wonders to himself whether or not in being constantly pointed to the big picture amongst all the news conferences and everything else, they're missing the small things that actually make the difference. So we, we see him board... Um, a new style of Minbari ship that we've not seen before. In it before, it's a Valen class cruiser, uh, probably for very obvious reasons. And um, he's on his way to this celebration at, at Babylon Five. But he's joined by an ISN reporter. And again, there was a name in the credits that I recognised, but I didn't know who it was. And I recognised the lady reporter's face, and I couldn't quite place it. So when I looked it up, it's the Doctor, Dr. Frazier, from Stargate, SG-1. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, of course it is. <laughs> that makes perfect sense after the fact. But, you know, she was in a very, very different situation playing a reporter. And I just didn't clock it at first. But I thought that was that was quite a nice little bit of sort of crossover there at the last. And um, it's quite funny because um, Sheridan explains to her that uh, the fact that there were two chairs in the in the viewing room is it was almost caused a massive upset on Minbar because Minbar ships traditionally speaking don't do chairs and he mentions of course the Grey Council as you know being a, a standing group of nine literally um and it's interesting that he that she calls him sir I can't remember anyone calling him sir before because he's the president of the ISA and um there's little sort of back and forth between them and it's quite funny because he asks where her camera is and she says it's right here and sort of points to a little uh, brooch on her chest. And she said, she said that her boss said that it would make sure that people looked at the camera a lot. <laughs> and Sheridan's not really being drawn on that. Um, so they go through um, a sort of little sort of repartee, commenting about pac jokes always ending in properly cooked. And um, then she basically asks him who's going to be at the delegation. And there is a sort of a sad moment there where... He mentions that both Londo is, is going to be missing, but he's going to be replaced by Prince Regent of um, Vitari, who's third in line to the throne. But also Jakar and indeed Franklin won't be there because they're both journeying beyond the rim, which of course is a reference to the fact that they both passed. Um, there's also mention of Garibaldi, but again, he's not coming and not, neither is Delenn. Delenn's occupied with other things. And I, David, their son, does get mentioned, but again, we never see him. And I half wonder whether or not there's something going on with him at the time, which means that Delenn's had to stay behind, because it doesn't feel like the sort of thing that she would miss. Um, but as I say, I think that these episodes are very much designed as spotlight episodes, and the 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 long-term plan would have seen JMS rotate through all of the main characters with episodes like this, where it's kind of just them and a few others. So that would have been that would have been really interesting to see, but we we just never got it, unfortunately. So this would have been after Crusade. So we assume, I guess, at this point that the telepath war has already happened. So there's no mention of Lita here, um, or anyone else from Crusade or anything like that, up to a point. So um, and she asks him again, rather than getting the sort of the press conference response. He gives a genuine response about going back to Babylon 5 and says it feels good. I mean, it's four of the most difficult but most worthwhile years of his life were spent there. So, you know, it, it always means something to him when he goes back. <laughs> and then and then we find out why Sheridan only tends to give two press interviews a year. Because it turns out that the, the, the Valen uses quantum space, which is twice the speed of normal hyperspace travel, but also twice as likely to make you lose your stomach which she promptly does and there's a lovely little sort of off-camera comment from Sheridan saying was that a new dress <laughs> which which I always made me chuckle at the time um so um yeah so 
basically on the way they drop out of quantum space and they rendezvous with now i think it's a vorchan class centauri cruiser one of the sort of um, four winged ones uh, because they've they're actually peak picking up the prince en route the prince regent en route because um there's a, there was a sort of a risk to him of being exposed to other centauri because as he says later to sheridan the fourth fifth and sixth in line would very much like to see him out of the way but there's an echo of a Lockley shot before that rendezvous happens where we see Sheridan sort of very close up, sleeping, with his eyes open, and he appears on a rooftop in front of a devastated landscape. And who should join us but Galen? At completely out of the blue, unannounced, as techno mages do. I last saw him very recently because I was, I've just been watching Crusade. But it was like, hey, it's Galen again, uh, which is great. I mean, I, I do really, really love his character, with Peter Woodward again. And um, he describes New York as the city that never weeps. And he sort of uses his staff and kind of winds back time. So we, we go back to a more active cityscape where I got Fifth Element vibes off it, actually, because there were sort of air-based air taxis zipping around and um, all that sort of good stuff. But he's not here for a sightseeing tour. Galen is here to deliver a prophecy of doom, basically. Because as they're standing on, on the top of the buildings, he explains that a thousand ships, deadly engines of destruction mounted on them, are arriving in, into real space around the planet. And massive energy beams start striking New York and clearly wipe it out. And... Sheridan demands to know why he he's, he's always the one who gets shown this crap to you know to to coin a phrase, and Galen says that he is a nexus. He has he is known amongst all the techno mages as someone who tends to believe what they tell him, which is an unusual trait. And Galen tells him that there are ways to prevent this happening, but he's never and Sheridan says he's never known hope when it wasn't on a diet, and. He basically says that the Prince Regent will ascend to the throne in 20 years time. And in 30 years time, he decides that the only world standing in between his desires for sort of global domination is Earth. Well, say global domination, universal domination is Earth. So he, he will be responsible for the attack on Earth. So he suggests that Sheridan kill him, um, which is super. So... After this conversation, um, he's left with a necklace by Galen just to sort of, I think, to reinforce the fact that it wasn't just a dream. And Sheridan says he knows what the difference between dream real and real real is. He's had enough you know, experience of it down the years. Then we have this random conversation between Sheridan and a couple of Minbari about spoobing the other grey meat. Um, and then um, we meet the Prince Regent, who is very young. And it turns out that he's Cartagia's son which I found very interesting, again, having just sort of seen the series relatively recently, that's kind of, uh, that's very interesting. And there's, there are moments where you see that little sort of flash of madness. He's well played. Um, he's well played by a um, chap called Keegan McIntosh. And um, he notes there as well that Veer is number two in line to the throne. So Veer has no interest in getting rid of him because it doesn't impact Veer if he does die. Because <laughs> Veer is number two. So that's established there in canon. And he notes that he likes Star Furies. He has a thing about spacecraft. So he's quite smitten with the fact that he's on board the latest Valen cruiser. Um, but he says he'd also, he also really, really likes Star Furies. He thinks they're a very sort of elegant craft. Very, very simple, but very elegant. And... Um, he says that at some point he will have a reckoning with his enemies because it would be, you know, he has to sleep with a knife by his bed, basically. And um, Sheridan can see that there is danger in him without a doubt. And so there's no, there's no indication at this point that Sheridan is going to not kill him. But um, he notices that uh, Vitari does say that it will, nice to, it will be nice to be safe for a while and not have to have a knife next to his bed. So, um, very interesting, very interesting. So, they drop out of, of um, drop back into normal space outside Babylon 5, and we see Lockley again briefly, um, sort of dealing with a, 
Sheridan having requisitioned a couple of Star Furies, and Galen has told Sheridan that he's he's his agents have tweaked one of them so that it'll it'll have a little accident when he hits a certain speed, and the weapon systems will open fire, and um, you know Galen sort of makes the the baby Adolf argument much like uh, Deadpool did, of course, you know to sort of. Um, you know what? What would have? How much better would the world have been had Adolf been killed as a baby? And so he's making the same argument for Vitarin. He's saying it'll be a terrible accident, much to be regretted. But at the end of the day, the Centauri themselves will be quite glad to see see him gone. So you know what's the problem basically? So Sheridan's going to mull that over, um, and we do see a little a little sort of snippet here as well of combat between. At least a couple of warlocks and um, Centauri ships and fighters and star furies and so on. So again, first time we see warlock actually doing something quite interesting, and then the last time we see a warlock doing anything uh, sort of interesting, barring fan-made stuff um, after the after the event. But at least we get that. Um, so, to his surprise, Sheridan invites Vitari to to fly the second star furry along with him so they can kind of both um arrive at the station in star furries which is what earth have, have asked them to do effectively is a sort of a reminisce back to the shadow war time um and as they're flying along vitari mentions that he had this sort of dream that he was going to be flying star furry and that something wonderful was going to happen and sheridan is just like i know where that's come from galen um so he's you know he's less than impressed and he's kind of talking himself into it as they as they get faster and faster heading in towards the station but then he recounts that galen said that there were ways in which that future could be avoided and at that point, he decides that he's not going to go ahead with it. And he pulls back and tells the computer to, to disarm the weapons. And Vitari asks him if something's wrong. He's very, very good with his star free controls. He sort of turns about on his axis and kind of looks directly back at him. And Sheridan says, no, he's, you know, he's good. He's fine. But um, Vitari should go on ahead and sort of hot dog it, basically. And he sort of, he smiles as he zooms off. And the, the episode ends both with Lockley meeting Vitari and sort of telling Sheridan that you know, she's had some interesting experiences over the last couple of days. Um, she and Vitari then go off to the, the reception. Galen comes to Sheridan, presumably in person on the station, and sort of says, you've broken our deal. And Sheridan says, yep, you're damn right I did, because you said there were ways to avoid this. And Galen still doesn't deny that, but he does say that they're not as certain as actually just offing him. But the Sheridan then says, but I think that you actually put me in a box and you manoeuvred me into this situation where he's actually offered that Vitari could come and live with he and Delenn on Minbar, where he would be safe and where they can try and teach him a slightly different view on the universe. And Sheridan hopes that in doing that, in showing him some genuine fun and calm and peace, that he might be able to sort of pull him away perhaps from from Cartagena's madness i guess um but sheridan does offer galen some reassurance that you know that he thinks that if he sees him going the wrong way he will then do something more permanent about it but he wants to try his way first and he thinks that that was always galen's intention uh, but galen leaves that as an unsolved mystery as is the techno mage way and then he does a sort of classic techno mage vanish on him as well um so sheridan then starts to walk towards the celebration and sa says um you know here we go again and that was it and that's the end of it was the end of his journey at that point in time in terms of you know being uh captain Sh well president sheridan himself in 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 the real world so to speak he would of course reprise the role for the road home but for me and for everyone else who watched the this series originally from 93 that was the end um and that was the last time we got to see the station for a very very long time and that brings me to you know to nearest damn it the end of my my little task that i set myself what three years ago now nearly um where i was going to you know rewatch everything and put an 
a YouTube video up on it and um, I've slowed down a little bit towards the end I must admit I think probably because as is the human way I've procrastinated because I didn't really want my journey through it to end in some respects but end it has and I am here um, I've I've really I've already commented on the road home I'm not sure if I'd do another sort of run through it. I could do, but I think it'll be harder for me to do screen captures off the Blu-ray. So I'm, I may just leave that, but if you'd like me to cover it, let me know in the comments and I will do. Um, I think I also want to have a look at the extras on Crusade, which I haven't done yet, but again, that's kind of on my list. So in terms of the actual episodes and the actual sort of core content, I think this is really sort of the end of Babelcon 5 as the series for me personally. Um, I may come back to it again. There are some of the early episodes where the the voice, the audio volume was, was quite poor. And I have redone one of them. I redid the first episode, as I may have mentioned already, um, just to see if that was of use to people, basically. And I think there were sort of four or five after that where I could do the same process. I'll just take them down and put them back up again in the, in the, in the same sort of play order. Um, what else do I need to do? I need to, oh, I need to do, um, the alternative playlist for Crusade actually as well. I haven't done that yet. So I need to add that to my to-do list as well. Um, which I may well li literally do right now. Um, Crusade playlists. So I don't know how many of you have been listening slash watching to this on a regular basis. Um, there seem to be there seems to be a surge of Babylon 5 podcasts going at the moment, which is a lovely thing because, you know, this is a... I think these, these guys have seen the series... Well, no, I, I correct myself. Some of them have seen the series before. Some of them are coming to it completely cold. And for someone like me who's seen it before, what, listening to the people who, who are coming to it cold is a great is great fun because, you know, they do go on some hilarious tangents you know damn well are not going to be a thing, but they have no reason to... To suspect for themselves that it won't be a thing so you know from their point of view it's completely normal what they're saying but for those who have seen it before it is it's not so much but um it's part of the enjoyment of watching people or listening to people who, who just aren't familiar so it's if you want to um you know to sort of keep being you know to revisit the series again i would recommend that you you have a look on spotify and other places for those sorts of podcasts that are, are ongoing and obviously you can always catch up with those as you would catch up with mine obviously so um you know i would certainly recommend it that, that you do that and there are also a lot of youtube people doing um you know sort of reactions and so on so um, you know medusa cascade for example is in a very good series where she i think she's nearly all the way through everything now um and she, like me, I think has had the odd pause here and there, but, um, you know, she covers that and Doctor Who and all sorts. So it's well worth having a look at her stuff as well. So, um, yeah, thanks to you for joining me along the way. Um, it's been very interesting for me personally because, you know, I've never even vaguely attempted to do something on quite this scale before and to try and keep it going on a you know, reasonably regular basis. And I did, I think, largely succeed in that. Um, so I'm quite happy with with how it went. And I've, you know, I've learned a lot around, along the way about things that I shouldn't shouldn't have been doing and sort of how to do this. I mean, right now I'm talking to you far more off the cuff than I normally did when I was doing the episodes um, individually. I used to do quite long word documents and stuff to support what I was doing there, but I've, I've dealt with it differently this time around. So um, if you would like me to cover anything else, then, you know, do let me know in the comments. And um, I'm going to keep on producing various different videos now on the... Uh, sort of the old science fiction toy front and that sort of thing so uh do, do stay tuned to the channel and um that's it for me for now so that's uh babblecom 5 saying goodbye for now at least temporarily so i'll catch you for the next one as and when cheers for now <laughs>